Eric de Bay is probably one of the most famous flat earthers out there. And recently he released a 30 minute video which he thinks proves the earth does not move at all. The problem is of course, his physics knowledge leaves a lot to be desired. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Before we begin with today's video though, I was reading earlier how NASA are returning astronauts from the ISS early due to medical concerns. And I was reading that story on Ground News, which was actually founded by a former NASA engineer called Harleen Kaur, who worked on the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, Ground News combines stories and articles from thousands of outlets, local and national, in one place so readers can see the full picture of what's being reported around the world. As you can see here, Ground News shows you if there's any political leanings for each publication. And in this instance, with the story regarding the astronauts coming home early from the ISS, we can see that it's mainly centre-driven, with a total of 263 news sources. For every story, you get a quick visual breakdown of the news outlook covering it, what their political bias is, how factual the source is, which entity owns the source, and which countries are covering the story. Now, Ground News is also gaining notoriety for its work. They were recently recognised by the Nobel Peace Centre for their impact on media literacy, saying it's an excellent way to stay informed, avoid echo chambers and expand your world view, which is exactly why we use Ground News as well. You can see every side to every story with access to international perspectives that are hard to find, so then you can make informed decisions where you can read, watch and share the best information information available. And Ground News is mission-centric. It's not about eliminating bias, but providing better transparency. And they're funded by their community, not by big ads or investors. So go to ground.news slash Simon to stay fully informed on breaking news and compare coverage. Subscribe through my link in the description for 40% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as useful as I do. Right then, on with today's video, which as I said in the intro, comes from Eric DeBay. His video, which apparently proves that the Earth does not move, has over 25,000 views and a lot of the comments seem to support Eric. Very worrying, so we're going to spend a few episodes debunking the entire thing. Here we go. Soren Kierkegaard said, there are two ways of being fooled. One, to believe what is not true. Two, to refuse to believe what is true. All the arguments put forward here boil down to one issue. Does the earth move against a background of stationary stars? Or is the earth still, and the stars moving? In the 17th and 18th centuries, scholars and scientists were beginning to accept the heliocentric model as factual, and astronomers were anxious to find an experiment that provided concrete evidence the earth was moving. One solution appeared in the early 17th century by James Bradley, the British Astronomer Royal. Okay, the one issue framing is poor sleight of hand for Merrick here. Whether Earth moves relative to the stars is not a matter of opinion. It's been measured and repeated using multiple independent methods. That is a poor star, Eric. His theory was that if the Earth was moving in orbit around the Sun, then the stars being still could be seen as a point of reference. James Bradley was trying to measure stellar parallax, which would use stars as reference points if Earth orbited the Sun. That experiment failed, not because the Earth doesn't move, but because the stars were so far away that the parallax was too small to detect with 18th century instruments. If a particular star was chosen, for example Gamma Draconis, this star could serve as the anchor point. The Earth takes one year to make an orbit of the Sun, so if he plotted the apparent position of the star in relation to the Earth's movement in orbit, logically then, the plotted points would form a small circle, or ellipsoid, a sort of reflection of the Earth's orbital movement. Yes, James Bradley expected that if Earth orbited the Sun, a nearby star like Gamma Draconis would appear to trace a tiny ellipse over the year due to stellar parallax. That expectation was correct in principle, but that's not what happened, is it, Eric? Bradley set up a telescope pointing up vertically to see the star, and expected over time, as the Earth moved in orbit, the line of sight of the star would fall out of vision, so the telescope had to be tilted to keep the stationary stars in sight as the Earth moved. Logically, he believed the telescope would have to be tilted several times. Bradley's experiment was hailed as a success and claimed to be one of the major appendixes of heliocentricity to this day. 
James Bradley didn't just point a telescope upwards and hope for the best. He used a zenith telescope fixed vertically, and that was to eliminate mechanical errors. The idea was simple. If Earth moves, a nearby star apparent position should drift due to parallax and the star would slowly wander out the crosshairs. That didn't happen. Instead, something far stranger showed up. The star didn't drift randomly or seasonally based on Earth's position in its orbit. It traced a perfect repeatable annual pattern, synced not to where Earth was, but to how fast Earth was moving at each point in its orbit. Worse for the stationary Earth idea, the maximum shift occurred when parallax predicted zero. Bradley had discovered stellar aberration. But European astronomers were later thinking that Bradley's evidence was tenuous and threadbare, and that there must be a better way to determine once and for all that the Earth moves in orbit around the Sun. Astronomers and scientists in Europe, however, were not happy with Bradley's experiment, believing the evidence to prove the Earth was moving tenuous and sketchy. Roger Joseph Boscovich, a Serbian theoretical astronomer, tried to reproduce Bradley's experiment but using a water-filled telescope. This, he believed, would bend the starlight by refraction and slow down the light so the telescope would not need to be tilted as the Earth moved. First, a quick note on exactly what stellar aberration is. It's the apparent shift in a star's position caused by Earth moving through space, whilst the star's light takes time to reach us. Like having to tilt an umbrella forward whilst you're running in the rain. Boscovich's experiment wasn't trying to disprove Bradley. He was testing how aberration depends on the speed of light in a medium. If aberration vanished in water, that would tell us something profound about light. If it didn't, that would tell us something else profound about light. And guess what? Aberration did not disappear. In 1866, George Bedell Airy, Astronomer Royal, repeated Boscovich's experiment using a water-filled telescope. Airy followed an accepted scientific methodology to the letter, and the records are still available to this day. Scientists and astronomers eagerly awaited Airy's results and were expecting the experimental concrete evidence that Earth moves. But Aries' result was not what was expected, and the experiment was dubbed Aries' failure, because he could not show progressive tilt of the telescope as the Earth moved. This is just flat out wrong, both historically and scientifically. George Airy did repeat the water-filled telescope experiment, and it was not called Airy's failure by scientists. That label only exists in flat earth YouTube lore. Airy's result was exactly what physics predicted. Stellar aberration stayed the same, even with water in the telescope. Why? Because aberration depends on Earth's velocity, not what's inside the telescope. The light is already angled before it even enters the instrument. So Airy didn't fail to show that Earth moves. He helped prove that the Earth moves and light behaves exactly as modern physics predicts it should do. Airy followed up on Bradley's work to prove the Earth was moving. But heliocentrists today say that Airy failed because he failed to find the ether, a mysterious substance that permeated the whole universe. This is an example of how when scientists are cornered by genuine scientific evidence, they change the goalposts in order to make a failure into a resounding success. Yes, you heard that right. A flat earther accusing us of moving the goalposts. That's a good joke, Eric. I must remember that one. But Airy's experiment showed clearly the Earth does not move, supporting the geocentric paradigm, where the Earth does not move, quite contrary to the heliocentric model. To astronomer scientists, it was a failure. But to those pursuing scientific truth, the experiment was a resounding success. Why was it seen as a failure and a disappointment? Because it failed to meet the paradigm expectations, showing that the experiment was paradigm-driven, looking for evidence of what astronomers already believed to support the heliocentric model. Is Airy, an accomplished astronomer, listed in those hollowed halls of astronomy? Try to find the name George Bedell Airy in a modern student textbook, university curriculum, or glossy encyclopedia of astronomy. There may be a brief mention, but other than that, virtually nothing. It appears George Bedell Airy has been airbrushed out of history. The claim that Airy was airbrushed out of history is laughable. He was Astronomer Royale for 46 years. His name is attached to Airy's disc, 
Aries functions, Aries stress functions. And the prime meridian at Greenwich was established under his direction. He appears in optics textbooks, astronomy history textbooks, and physics curricula, just not in places cherry-picked by people hoping no one would check. He did, without any doubt, make many worthy contributions to other areas of astronomy, and retired as Astronomer Royal in 1881. So he wasn't airbrushed out of history then. Thanks for confirming, Eric. As seen in the following photos, the plumes from erupting volcanoes can be blown by prevailing winds thousands of feet above. But where there are no prevailing winds above, sometimes the plumes go straight up, as seen in the following photos. Now, using scientific observation and common sense, how could this be the case if the Earth is rotating on its axis at 19 miles per second on the equator, while at the same time is whizzing around the sun at almost 67,000 miles an hour. The atmosphere moves with the Earth. Everything on the surface, air, clouds, planes, volcano plumes, already shares Earth's rotational and orbital velocity. There is no sideways blast to blow plumes over, just like there's no wind in smoothly cruising aeroplane cabins. Earth's rotation and orbit speeds around the sun are irrelevant here because these motions are uniform. Only changes in velocity cause deflection, and there isn't one. When heliocentric believers are confronted with simple facts based on simple observations, science does not matter. It is the deeply ingrained belief in the psyche that carries the day. Just as it was hard to convince medieval doctors that bleeding a patient was of no use at all because of indoctrination of the masses, this practice was almost impossible to dislodge. Heliocentrists will find an answer to anything that conflicts to make it fit with their belief and call it science to justify the trillions of dollars spent on space exploration. Science isn't people finding answers to protect beliefs. It's testing ideas against reality and throwing them away when they fail. Bloodletting was abandoned precisely because observation and evidence showed it didn't work. That example actually proves the opposite of what he thinks it does. Well done you, Eric. As mentioned, astronomers, according to the heliocentric paradigm, believe the Earth has a double motion, rotating around its own axis at about 1,024 miles per hour at the equator, and traveling around the Sun at approximately 67,000 miles per hour. Back in 1887, two physicists, Michelson and Morley, conducted an experiment to find the velocity of the Earth in orbit around the Sun, and personally for Michelson, to show his lifetime belief the ether existed. That experiment was not designed to measure Earth's orbital speed directly. It was designed to detect motion through a hypothetical medium called the luminiferous ether. Michelson did expect the ether to exist. That's true, and that's exactly why this experiment is famous, because it failed to detect the ether. For centuries, scientists have believed that the whole of space was filled with what was termed the luminiferous ether. But until this time in the 1880s, the ether was assumed to exist. Michelson was hoping to find scientific experiments to produce evidence that the ether really did exist. The ether was believed to be undetectable, tasteless, invisible, an almost mystical substance that permeated the whole universe, including space. Tasteless? Tasteless? Seems an odd one to put in there, but okay. So when objects such as the Earth moved through the ether, it may be possible to detect the relative motion of objects such as the Earth by its effect on the light waves. All energy, whether light, sound, or electricity, can be represented as a wave-like motion that requires some medium through which they can travel, just as water is needed to allow waves to travel across the surface of the sea. The key mistake here is this line. All energy requires some medium through which they can travel. Sound needs a medium, true. Water waves need a medium, true. Light does not, and that's experimentally demonstrated. Electromagnetic waves are self-propagating oscillations of electric and magnetic fields. They don't ride on anything. It's built into Maxwell's equations and is confirmed every time light crosses through a vacuum. The notion of the ether was believed to have been proposed by Plato, and conceived by his student Aristotle. In the 17th century, René Descartes made reference to the ether, and the idea was embraced and assumed to exist by all scientists, including Isaac Newton, to be filling space. So logically, light from the sun and stars must have some medium to travel through, the ether. Yes, Plato and Aristotle speculated about a fifth element, 
ether. And it was a philosophical idea, not a measurable substance. And Newton cautiously entertained ether as a possibility. But crucially, none of that is evidence for its existence. Albert Mickelson invited his friend Edward Morley, and together they embarked on a series of experiments that produced curious and disturbing results. Mickelson's hope from being a high school graduate was to detect the ether, and he was well qualified for this research. Four years at Annapolis, eight years at the Case Institute, Ohio, and three years at Clark University, Massachusetts. Mickelson was talented in many ways, and designed and made his own device, called an interferometer, for measuring the speed of light. The real purpose, however, of their experiment was to find the velocity of the Earth in orbit around the Sun, and the assumed ether became part of that experiment. As I said, Mickelson and Morley did not design this experiment to measure Earth's orbital velocity. The velocity was already well known by astronomy. The purpose of the interferometer experiment was very specific, to detect motion through the ether, like I said, by looking for changes in the speed of light in different directions. Mickelson built that interferometer to measure the tiny differences in light travel time with unprecedented precision. If Earth was moving through in ether, the light beams would arrive out of phase. And we will look at that experiment and its results next time when we come back and carry on looking at this video. For now though, I'm going to wrap up another Flat Earth Friday for another video. Please do let me know in the comments below what you thought of this one, as I say we're all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching today as ever, it's appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too. Just enough time to once again thank Ground News for sponsoring today's video. Remember, go to ground.news slash Simon, stay fully informed on breaking news and compare media coverage. Subscribe through my link below for 40% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as useful useful as I do. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great day and I'll see you tomorrow for another Saturday session. What will I have up to then? Who knows? See you then.